Chapter 13 of Fifty Years in Chains or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fifty Years in Chains or The Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. Chapter 13. An affair was now in progress, which, though the persons who were actors in it were far removed from me, had in its effects a great influence upon the fortunes of my life. I have informed the reader that my master had three daughters, and that the second of the sisters was deemed a great beauty. The eldest of the three was married about the time of which I now write to a planter of great wealth, who resided near Columbia but the second had formed an attachment to a young gentleman whom she had frequently seen at the church attended by my master's family. As this young man, either from want of wealth or proper persons to introduce him, had never been at my master's house, my young mistress had no opportunity of communicating to him the sentiments she entertained toward him, without violating the rules of modesty in which she had been educated. Before she would attempt anything which might be deemed a violation of the decorum of her sex, she determined to take a new method of obtaining a husband. She communicated to her father, my master, a knowledge of the whole affair, with a desire that he would invite the gentleman of her choice to his house. This the father resolutely opposed, upon the ground that the young man upon whom his daughter had fixed her heart was without property and consequently destitute of the means of supporting his daughter in a style suitable to the rank she occupied in society. A woman in love is not easily foiled in her purposes. My young mistress, by continual entreaties, so far prevailed over the affections, or more probably the fears of her father, that he introduced the young man to his family, and about two months afterwards my young mistress was a bride but it had been agreed upon amongst all the parties as i understood before the marriage that as the son-in-law had no land or slaves of his own he should remove with his wife to a large tract of land that my master owned in the new purchase in the state of georgia in the month of september my master came to the quarter one evening at the time of our return from the field in company with his son-in-law and informed me that he had given me, with a number of others of his slaves, to his daughter, and that I, with eight other men and two or three women, must set out on the next Sunday with my new master for his estate in Georgia, whither we were to go to clear land, build houses, and make other improvements necessary for the reception of the newly married lady in the following spring. I was much pleased with the appearance and manners of my new master, who was a young man apparently about twenty-seven or eight years old, and of good figure. We were to take with us, in our expedition to Georgia, a wagon to be drawn by six mules, and I was appointed to drive the team. Before we set off, my young mistress came in person to the quarter, and told us that all those who were going to the new settlement must come to the house, where she furnished each of us with two full suits of clothes, one of coarse woolen, and the other of hempen cloth. She also gave a hat to each of us, and two pairs of shoes, with a trifle in money, and enjoined us to be good boys and girls, and get things ready for her and that when she should come to live with us we should not be forgotten. The conduct of this young lady was so different from that which I had been accustomed to witness since I came to Carolina, that I considered myself highly fortunate in becoming her slave, and now congratulated myself with the idea that I should in future have a mistress who would treat me kindly, and if I behaved well, would not permit me to want. At the time appointed, we set out for Georgia with all the tools and implements necessary to the prosecution of a new settlement. My young master accompanied us and traveled slowly for several days to enable me to keep up with him. We continued our march in this order until we reached the Savannah River at the town of Augusta, where my master told me that he was so well satisfied with my conduct that he intended to leave me with a team to bring on the goods and the women and children but that he would take the men and push on as fast as possible to the new settlement and go to work until the time of my arrival. 
He gave me directions to follow on and inquire for Morgan County Courthouse and said that he would have a person ready there on my arrival to guide me to him and the people with him. He then gave me twenty dollars to buy food for the mules and provisions for myself and those with me, and left me on the high road, master of myself and the team. I was resolved that this striking proof of confidence on the part of my master should not be a subject of regret to him and pursued my route with the greatest diligence, taking care to lay out as little money as possible for such things as I had to buy. On the sixth day in the morning I arrived at our new settlement in the middle of a heavy forest of such timber as is common to that country, with three dollars and twenty-five cents in my pocket, part of the money given to me at Augusta. This I offered to return, but my master refused to take it, and told me to keep it for my good conduct. I now felt assured that all my troubles in this world were ended, and that in future I might look forward to a life of happiness and ease, for I did not consider labor any hardship if I was well provided with good food and clothes, and my other wants properly regarded. My master and the people who were with him had, before our arrival with a wagon, put up the logs of two cabins, and were engaged when we came in covering one of them with clapboards. In the course of the next day we completed both these cabins, with puncheon floors and small glass windows, the sash and glass for which I had brought in the wagon. We put up two other cabins and a stable for the mules, and then began to clear the land. After a few days my master told me he meant to go down into the settlements to buy provisions for the winter, and that he should leave me to oversee the hands and carry on the work in his absence. He accordingly left us taking with him the wagon and two boys, one to drive the team and the other to drive cattle and hogs, which he intended to buy and drive to our settlement. I now felt myself almost proprietor of our new establishment, and believe the men left under my charge did not consider me a very lenient overseer. I, in truth, compelled them to work very hard, as I did myself. At the end of a week, my master returned with a heavy load of meal and bacon, with salt, and other things that we needed, and the day following a white man drove to our station several cows and more than twenty hogs, the greater part of which were breeders. At this season of the year neither the hogs nor the cattle required any feeding at our hands. The woods were full of nuts and the grass was abundant, but we gave salt to our stock and kept the hogs in a pen for two or three days to accustom them to the place. We now lived very differently from what we did on my old master's plantation. We had as much bacon every day as we could eat, which, together with bread and sweet potatoes, which we had at will, constituted our fare. My master remained with us more than two months, within which time we had cleared forty acres of ground, ready for the plough. But a few days before Christmas an event took place which, in its consequences, destroyed all my prospects of happiness and totally changed the future path of my life. A messenger one day came to our settlement with a letter, which had been forwarded in this manner by the postmaster at the courthouse, where the post office was kept. The letter contained intelligence of the sudden death of my old master, and that difficulties had arisen in the family which required the immediate attention of my young one. The letter was written by my mistress. My master forthwith took an account of the stock of provisions and other things that he had on hand, and putting the whole under my charge, gave me directions to attend to the work, and then set off on horseback that evening, promising to return within one month at the furthest. We never saw him again, and heard nothing of him until late in the month of January, when the eldest son of my late master came to our settlement in company with a strange gentleman. The son of my late master informed me, to my surprise and sorrow, that my young master, who had brought us to Georgia, was dead, and that he and the gentleman with him were administrators of the deceased, and had come to Georgia for the purpose of letting out on lease, for the period of seven years, our place, with all the people on it, including me. To me the most distressing part of this news was the death of my young master and I was still more sorry when I learned that he had been killed in a duel. My young mistress, whose beauty had drawn around her numerous suitors, 
many of whom were men of base minds and cowardly hearts, had chosen her husband in the manner I have related, and his former rivals, after his return from Georgia, confederated together for the dastardly purpose of revenging themselves of both husband and wife by the murder of the former. In all parts of the cotton country there are numerous taverns which answer the double purpose of drinking and gambling houses. These places are kept by men who are willing to abandon all pretensions to the character and standing of gentlemen for the hope of sordid gain, and are frequented by all classes of planters, though it is not to be understood that all the planters resort to these houses. There are men of high and honorable virtue among the planters who equally detest the mean cupidity of the men who keep these houses, and the silly wickedness of those who support them. Billiards is the game regarded as the most polite amongst men of education and fashion. But cards, dice, and every kind of game, whether of skill or of hazard, are openly played in these sinks of iniquity. So far as my knowledge extends, there is not a single district of ten miles square in all the cotton region without at least one of these vile ordinaries, as they are frequently and justly termed. The keeping of these houses is a means of subsistence resorted to by men of desperate reputation or reckless character, and they invite as guests all the profligate, the drunken, the idle, and the unwary of the surrounding country. In a community where the white man never works, except at the expense of forfeiting all claim to the rank of a gentleman, and where it is beneath the dignity of a man to oversee the labor of his own plantation, the number of those who frequent these gaming houses may be imagined. My young master, fortunately for his own honor, was one of those who kept aloof from the precincts of the tavern, unless compelled by necessary business to go there. But the band of conspirators who had resolved on his destruction invited him through one of their number, who pretended to wish to treat with him concerning his property, to meet them at an ordinary one evening. Here a quarrel was sought with him, and he was challenged to fight with pistols over the table around which they sat. My master, who it appears was unable to bear the reproach of cowardice, even amongst fools, agreed to fight and as he had no pistols with him, was presented with a pair belonging to one of the gang, and accepted their owner as his friend or second in the business. The result was as might have been expected. My master was killed at the first fire by a ball which passed through his breast, whilst his antagonist escaped unharmed. A servant was immediately dispatched with a letter to my mistress, informing her of the death of her husband. She was awakened in the night to read the letter, the bearer having informed her maid that it was necessary for her to see it immediately. The shock drove her into a feverish delirium, from which she never recovered. At periods her reason resumed its dominion, but in the summer following she became a mother and died in childbed of piuperal fever. I obtained this account from the mouth of a black man who was the traveling servant of the eldest son of my old master, and who was with his master at the time he came to visit the tenant to whom he led his sister's estate in Georgia. The estate to which I was now attached was advertised to be rented for the term of seven years, with all the stock of mules, cattle, and so forth upon it, together with seventeen slaves, six of whom were too young to be able to work at present. The price asked was $1,000 for the first year, and $2,000 for each of the six succeeding years, the tenant to be bound to clear thirty acres of land annually. Before the day on which the estate was to be let, by the terms of the advertisement, a man came up from the neighborhood of Savannah and agreed to take the new plantation on the terms asked. He was immediately put into possession of the premises, and from this moment I became his slave for the term of seven years. Fortune had now thrown me into the power of a new master, of whom, when I considered the part of the country from whence he came, which had always been represented to me as distinguished for the cruelty with which slaves were treated in it, I had no reason to expect much that was good. I had indeed, from the moment I saw this new master, and had learned the place of his former residence, made up my mind to prepare myself for a harsh servitude. But as we are often disappointed for the worse, sometimes it happens that we are deceived for the better. 
This man was by no means so bad as I was prepared to find him, and yet I experienced all the evils in his service that I had ever apprehended, but I could never find it in my heart to entertain a revengeful feeling towards him, for he was as much a slave as I was, and I believe of the two the greater sufferer. Perhaps the evils he endured himself made him more compassionate of the sorrows of others. But notwithstanding the injustice that was done me whilst with him, I could never look upon him as a bad man. At the time he took possession of the estate he was alone, and did not let us know that he had a wife until after he had been with us at least two weeks. One day, however, he called us together, and told us that he was going down the country to bring up his family, and that he wished us to go on with the work on the place in the manner he pointed out, and after telling the rest of the hands they must obey my orders, he left us. He was gone full two weeks, and when he returned I had all the cleared land planted in cotton, corn, and sweet potatoes, and had progressed with the business of the plantation so much to his satisfaction that he gave me a dollar, with which I bought a pair of new trousers, my old ones having been worn out in clearing the new land and burning logs. My master's family, a wife and one child, came with him, and my new mistress soon caused me to regret the death of my former young master, for other reasons than those of affection and esteem. This woman, though she was my mistress, I cannot call her a lady, was the daughter of a very wealthy planter who resided near Milledgeville, and had several children besides my mistress. My master was a native of North Carolina, had removed to Georgia several years before this, had acquired some property, and was married to my mistress more than two years, when I became his slave for a term of years, as I have stated. I saw many families, and was acquainted with the moral character of many ladies while I lived in the South. But I must, in justice to the country, say that my new mistress was the worst woman I ever saw amongst the Southern people. Her temper was as bad as that of a speckled viper, and her language, when she was enraged, was a mere vocabulary of profanity and virulence. My master and mistress brought with them, when they came, twelve slaves, great and small, seven of whom were able to do field work. We now had on our new place a very respectable force, and my master was a man who understood the means of procuring a good day's work from his hands, as well as any of his neighbors. He was also a man who, when left to pursue his own inclinations, was kind and humane in his temper and conduct toward his people and if he had possessed courage enough to whip his wife two or three times, as he sometimes whipped his slaves, and to compel her to observe a rule of conduct befitting her sex, I should have had a tolerable time of my servitude with him, and should in all probability have been a slave in Georgia until this day. Before my mistress came, we had meat in abundance, for my master had left his keys with me, and I dealt out the provisions to the people. Lest my master should complain of me at his return, or suspect that I had not been faithful to my trust, I had only allowed ourselves, for I fared in common with the others, one meal of meat each day. We had several cows that supplied us with milk, and a barrel of molasses was among the stores of provisions. We had mush, sweet potatoes, milk, molasses, and sometimes butter for breakfast and supper, and meat for dinner. Had we been permitted to enjoy this fine fare after the arrival of our mistress, and had she been a woman of kindly disposition and ladylike manners, I should have considered myself well off in the world, for I was now living in as good a country as I ever saw, and I much doubt if there is a better one anywhere. Our mistress gave us a specimen of her character on the first morning after her arrival amongst us, by beating severely with a raw cowhide the black girl who nursed the infant, because the child cried and could not be kept silent. I perceived by this that my mistress possessed no control over her passions, and that when enraged she would find some victim to pour her fury upon, without regard to justice or mercy. When we were called to dinner to-day we had no meat, and a very short supply of bread, our meal being composed of badly cooked sweet potatoes, some bread, and a very small quantity of sour milk. 
From this time our allowance of meat was withdrawn from us altogether, and we had to live upon our bread, potatoes, and the little milk that our mistress permitted us to have. The most vexatious part of the new discipline was the distinction that was made between us, who were on the plantation before our mistress came to it, and the slaves that she brought with her. To these latter she gave the best part of the sour milk, all the buttermilk, and I believe frequently rations of meat. We were not on our part, I mean us of the old stock, wholly without meat, for our master sometimes gave us a whole flitch of bacon at once that he had stolen from his own smokehouse. I say stolen, because he took it without the knowledge of my mistress, and always charged us in the most solemn manner not to let her know that we had received it. She was as negligent of the duties of a good housewife as she was arrogant in assuming the control of things not within the sphere of her domestic duties, and never missed the bacon that our master gave to us, because she had not taken the trouble of examining the state of the meat-house. Obtaining all the meat we ate by stealth, through our master, our supplies were not regular, coming once or twice a week, according to circumstances. However, as I was satisfied of the good intentions of my master towards me, I felt interested in his welfare, and in a short time became warmly attached to him. He fared but little better at the hands of my mistress than I did, except as he ate at the same table with her. He always had enough of comfortable food, but in the matter of ill language, I believe my master and I might safely have put our goods together as a joint stock in trade without either the one or the other being greatly the loser. I had secured the good opinion of my master, and it was perceivable by any one that he had more confidence in me than in any of his other slaves, and often treated me as the foreman of his people. This aroused the indignation of my mistress, who, with all her ill qualities, retained a sort of selfish esteem for the slaves who had come with her from her father's estate. She seldom saw me without giving me her customary salutation of profanity, and she exceeded all other persons that I have ever known in the quickness and sarcasm of the jibes and jeers with which she seasoned her oaths. To form any fair conception of her volubility and scurrilous wit, it was necessary to hear her, more especially on Sunday morning or a rainy day when the people were all loitering about the kitchens which stood close round her dwelling. She treated my master with no more ceremony than she did me. Misery loves company, it is said, and I verily believe that my master and I felt a mutual attachment on account of our mutual sufferings. End of chapter 13